Hello and welcome to another Piper Pod. Today is the last episode in the series of the reproductive system and we're going to be looking at what happens if fertilization occurs, implantation, placenta development, fetal development and a little bit on labor itself. So starting right at the very start of fetal development. So once fertilization uh, occurs, it's, it's measured by the number of weeks generally after fertilization. Now yes, you can have trimesters and things like that, but generally when you're speaking clinically, you're looking at weeks post fertilization. Now the average um, pregnancy lasts about 40 weeks, okay, or 280 days of your last menstrual um, period. So whilst there's no true way to tell when fertilization occurs, it's generally 14 days, okay, can be anywhere between 10 and 14 days, but we go off 14 days after last menstrual period. Okay, so when you when you start 14 days after that, with when fertilization can occur, generally speaking. So it doesn't really matter that what we go off in order to categorize the number of weeks that a baby is being old in the uterus. Now from there we have obviously measurements that we can do with ultrasound that gives us a better idea, but it's still a massive educated guesstimation of time realistically. Now there's three stages of fetal development. So there's obviously the pre-embryonic stage, which is fertilization, which happens right through until about week two. Once we get to week two, uh, we start referring to the baby as an embryo. Um, itself okay and then once we get to week nine the embryo turns into a fetus now I'm not going to get into the debate of when a baby is a baby because it's not the focus of this presentation and you can be free to believe whatever it is you want I'm just going to talk about the science behind it okay so let's start right at the start with fertilization so we've already talked about ovulation once ovulation occurs, we have an oocyte, or an ovum, that is part way through uh, its second meiosis phase. Okay, so metaphase of meiosis two is where it's at. Now, fertilization represents day zero of the entire process. And when that occurs, obviously meiosis two is completed and we have a viable zygote after that. Now, fertilization occurs um, in the fallopian tubes. Okay, that's the most common place for fertilization to occur. And then once it occurs, it travels along until it makes it all the way to the uterus. But that takes about three to five days to get to the uterus. Now, as it's traveling along, the actual zygote goes through a series of cellular divisions of mitosis where it actually starts to compact it itself. Once it gets up to uh, 16 cells, it becomes a compacted molora. So it's no longer in its eight cell, four cell stage. It now becomes a compacted molora, and that's what it's called. From there, if you look at it under a microscope, it looks a little bit like a raspberry. Okay, it's kind of cute. Then it changes into what's known as an early blastocyte. Now what occurs there is the intercellular mass moves to one side of the cell and becomes highly compacted and we get a large cyst in the actual um, cell itself. Now the cyst is filled with a substance known as tropocytes. Okay, and it's that tropocytes that essentially is gonna help form the placenta. Once we get to about day eight or nine, the blastocyst cyst is essentially starting to form a little bit more, and then we start implantation, which is where the intercellular mass is against the uterine wall and the actual uh, tropocyst around the outside, the capsule, uh, starts the production of the placenta. Now the way that it does that is pretty unique. So the tropocyst will start releasing enzymes into the uterine wall. Now this en enzyme will do a number of things. It will degrade the uterine wall and use that particular uh, material in order to build itself. 
So it will build capsules, it will start the formation of uh, its own blood supply and its own specialized substances like your chronic ovillus and your outer chronon cellular membrane that capsulates the embryo itself. Now the formation of the embryo occurs with those two different specialized structures that we talked about, the cellular mass and the tripocyte. That will become the embryotic sac, or sorry, the, the amniotic sac, the fetus itself in the middle, and the yolk sac as well. Now the yolk sac is what will provide the fetus with the initial supply of red blood cells, the nutrients for initial cellular division until it can establish blood supply with the rest of the placenta. So that's what the yolk sac is for. So once we get to about day 16, the actual blastocyst is completely encapsulated within the uterus itself. And from there, we have very specialized uh, baby and mum structures that help form the placenta from there. So when we look at placenta development, what actually happens is those chroniculus villus actually extend out, releasing enzymes, stealing a little bit of mum's material, combining next to mum's circulation, and will form the outer placental wall, the amniotic cavity, and the mum baby blood barrier itself. So as I'm sure you are all aware, mum's and bub's blood do not mix. They essentially run along each other around the placenta and that is actually how the baby will get its nutrients once the yolk sac is depleted when the placenta is finished development okay around the four and a half week mark the placenta will be finished to be developed and the maternal blood will run close or sorry will run through the placenta and then through membranes will actually pass nutrients and oxygens to the baby and help release all or remove all the cellular waste and carbon dioxide that the baby is producing. Okay, so the placenta itself has a blood barrier with membranes, so there's no crossing of blood at all, and then it will pass on all the nutrients from there. Okay, so the placenta is very cool. It's a product of both baby and mum, okay, which makes it a quite a unique substance uh, as far as the human body goes, because the baby, even though it's half the creation of yourself, can easily be seen as a foreign body. So if we had the mixing of blood, and we had a slightly different blood group, which is entirely possible, then the mother could attack the baby, or the baby's blood could attack the mum. Okay, so it's always best to have those two separated. Now there's obviously risks of blood swapping when we do things like amniocentesis and stuff like that. So we only want to really want to do those things if it's absolutely necessary. Okay, from there, once the placenta is formed, then the baby starts to grow. And this is where we divide it into weeks. And then we also start looking at um, our trimesters as well, okay? So the first trimester represents from start up to 13 weeks on. Now it's around the week three to week four, uh, it's a little bit of arguments in literature, believe it or not, that the heart itself begins to beat. Now at this stage, before the placenta is born, it's pretty immature beating, okay? It's not really passing too much around and the baby's getting all its nutrients from the blood sac, I mean the yolk sac itself. But from there, it once it gets connected to the placenta, we'll talk about the difference between fetal circulation and stuff like that later on. It's also around week four uh, that the backbone begins to form and we start to get our nervous system, okay? And our arms, our legs begin to take on their a little bit of features. Okay, around week six, we have uh, the brain can actually start connecting to muscle movement, so it starts the coordination. And then at week eight, we have actual heart chambers and more physical completeness. So week eight, you'll actually, the fetus will look like uh, a baby and essentially be physically complete 
just really small. Okay, so it's at week eight that we no longer, at the end of week eight, we no longer refer to the growth as an embryo and it turns into a fetus itself. And now, week um, 13 represents the end of the first trimester and 14 is the start of the second. So at week 16 is where the mum can start well, you can feel the baby beforehand. This is when you can really start feeling the baby because the baby starts to move and hiccup. And the baby also has the ability to sense and hear everything that's happening in the outside world. Around the week 20 mark, the skin starts to develop. So you'll get to get proper skin. So you know it'll be transparent. You'll actually start your external defense systems, if you will. And then by week 24, you'll start to have the full function of the oily secretions and sweat glands functioning uh, fully from that point on. Now, week 28 is when you um, you finish your, or well, anywhere between week 28 through to 32, you'll finish your surfactant production, so your lungs are now viable. And then 29 weeks, you're pretty much fully developed. You just need to grow from there. Okay? You can blink. Uh, and you can respond to light, you're more interactive with the in environment. But it's not until about week 32 that you'll actually start to produce your own antibodies. So the antibody will produce, and they think that this has got to do with the fact that you will start breathing in amniotic fluid. So the exposure to material is much greater from there. But from that point on, you'll have a little bit more development with the lungs and things like that. But from there, you just chunk up, okay? You get fat and you grow immensely. Okay, so the third trimester, starting at week 27 and week 26, is all about finalized development and beefing out the baby in order to go from something that's really quite small uh, into normal baby size, okay, up to around about the 50 centimeters in length but usually about you know the 43 through to 60 these days uh size of babies okay and that's fetal development within the body now obviously i could do another series of 47 lectures on fetal development i just wanted to give you a um an overview of of how it occurs and a few key milestones realistically now the hormones that make all this possible Again, quite unique. So I'm just going to draw connections between number two, when we looked at the female and the menstrual cycle, ovarian cycle, things like that, and then talk about the swap over. So the corpus luteum, uh, which is obviously the, the temporary endocrine tissue that's produced by uh, ruptured follicles within the ovaries, uh, will continue to produce progesterone for about two to three months, waiting until the placenta to be completely developed. Okay, so it will keep producing uh, progesterone and we'll get a little bit of estrogen coming from um, the ovaries as well. Not as much as you'd think because you don't really need that much itself. Now from there, once the placenta is formed, then it starts to produce its own progesterone, its own estrogen, and it also produces your human chronolytic gonadotropic, so beta HCG, will get produced by the placenta. Now, this is only produced in females during pregnancy. Now, what it does, even though it starts to be producing as soon as the placenta starts to form, so really early, we start producing this, is beta HCG actually enhances or takes over the luteinizing hormone in maintaining the corpus luteum until the placenta can be finished. From there, it just continues to be released, assisting in progesterone um, production. Presenta also produces inhibitin, which stops the follicle stimulating hormone from being produced, which is very, very handy because whilst you're pregnant, you don't want the, the extra ability to have implantation fertilization occur. So inhibib will stop follicle stimulating, which will stop ovum production whilst pregnant. Now the human placental lactogen uh, works with prolactin in increasing breast size and starting uh, milk production itself. Okay, so that's what those two do and they're only really active during pregnancy itself. The other 
hormone that's released on mass. Obviously, a little bit's released by the corpus luteum, but relaxin is really released by the uterus when pregnancy uh, kicks in, especially as the fetus starts growing. We need the relaxin in order to elongate ligaments and allow for uterine um, spreading and organs moving around the body. Okay, so these are the, the hormones that will sustain pregnancy. Okay, but it's not until about the two month mark that the high risks of pregnancy or losing pregnancy really gets established because that's when we have the big swap over from the ovaries and the corpus luteum to the placenta taking over and stabilizing the hormone assistance throughout pregnancy itself. Okay, so that's what the slight difference is when fertilization occurs as opposed to when it doesn't and then the absence of the progesterone, sorry, the absence of the luteinizing hormone feedback will just cause the corpus luteum to break down and then you'll get menstruation. Okay. From there, we have our stages of labor. So labor is obviously what occurs. I know that seems like a big jump, fetal development, pregnancy, and then labor, but there's additional hormones that are sort of kick in when you're going through labor. So three stages. The first stage is all about uh, dilation. Okay, so this is the idea of the cervix relaxing causing effacement and dilation. And this is the longest aspect of pregnancy. So this is what takes the longest. Now, this is aided by hormones that are, estrogen plays a, a, a small role in the contractility of the uterus. And it's actually the estrogen that causes your, your Braxton Hicks. Okay, now the estrogen is released obviously throughout, but it can be peaked when the baby starts releasing cortisol itself. You get a strothlite spike in estrogen. Now, on top of that, the estrogen causes a contraction, but it also increases the amount of oxytocin receptor sites at the head of the cervix itself. So then once effacement and contractions occur and the baby's head hits the bottom of the cervix, increasing the dilation, uh, then that actually has a feedback system to increase the release of prostaglandins and oxytocin. Now when those two chemicals combine, we have an increase in contraction and an increase in obviously dilation. So blood supply allowing the cervix to dilate further and thin out and increase uterine contraction with the help of oxytocin pushing the baby down. Now from dilation we have expulsion, okay, which I don't really like the name of it, but that's, that's what it's called. And that's when the baby comes out. Now this is relatively shorter period. This is after the baby's head has essentially gone past the cervix and starts to go through the vaginal cavity and comes out. So this continues to be aided by oxytocin and those large contractions. And obviously the, the mother has a lot of relaxin on board as well, which allows for proprioceptors and stretch receptors to turn off, if you will, to allow for greater stretch without the feedback um, of spasming, basically, and uh, allow the baby to come out. Once the baby is fully out, then we move to the third stage, which is delivery of the placenta. Now, this will be assisted again by oxytocin, Okay, so oxytocin will still be within the system causing uterus, uterus to contract to help release the placenta. Now this can be aided by early nursing of a baby. So early nursing obviously will cause the suck reflex of the baby, which is a good thing to do nice and early, but then also increase um, nipple stimulation, which increases the amount of oxytocin that is released to aid in the placenta being released. Now, a lot of midwives or people delivering baby will slightly pull on the umbilical cord in order to um, assist it to come out, but obviously you need to be very, very careful how much pressure you put on it, because all lobes of, of the placenta must come out, otherwise you increase the likelihood of uterine bleeds, and then also um, uterine infections post um, delivery as well. 
Once the placenta has been delivered, it's always advisable uh, to check over the placenta for its completeness and also looking for your embryonic sacs, placental sacs intact, things like that. Okay, so that's the stages of labor and mostly the hormones and everything that assist within it. We're not gonna go through emergency childbirth or, or, or assistance in childbirth because it's not part of this particular presentation. Now, once the baby comes into the atmosphere, a lot of changes need to occur quite rapidly. Okay, so obviously inside the uh, uterus or in, inside the, the amniotic fluid, uh, it has no need to use the baby's lungs. So all the oxygen comes from the placenta barrier. So the placenta is pick up new oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide and waste, take nutrients in, and then the blood itself is actually delivered directly from the placenta through the umbilical cord into the umbilicus and then straight in to the actual inferior vena cava. Now whilst the liver is underdeveloped, therefore can't be utilized for any real function, then this baby has a structure in place called the ductus veniosus, but it allows for the blood supply to bypass the liver and go straight to the heart from there. Okay, so that's obviously a pretty useful substance. Otherwise, blood will be floating around an immature liver uh, for no purpose, where it needs to get to the rest of the body itself. So the oxygenated blood will go straight from the placenta into the inferior vena cava and then get to the heart. Once it gets to the heart, obviously, the baby's not using lungs. It's not getting oxygen from the lungs, so it doesn't really need to utilize anything in the lungs until born, basically. So we have two other shunts that are available during fetal development uh, that aid in this. So the first one is your foramen ovale, which is a hole in between the left and right atrium itself. So as blood comes in, it will actually mix straight through to the left atrium into the left ventricle to be pumped around the body. Okay, now obviously a little bit is going to go towards the lung, which is why we have another shunt called the ductus arterios, which will allow us to bypass the lungs and put the blood directly into the descending aorta to travel around the body. So that, that's pretty unique, obviously, during fetal development of blood supply from there. So as you can imagine, there's a few things that are quite unique about baby's blood that um, you will not find in adults or formed babies as they sort of progress the first couple of weeks. So first of all, the hemoglobin of a baby or a fetus, sorry, has much higher affinity to oxygen than an adult's hemoglobin. Now that allows any oxygen that is bound to mum's hemoglobin to move over into baby's hemoglobin. Okay, so it's far more affinity, a lot more affinity, which just means that it has a much lower partial pressure than mums. So it'll actually take a good percentage of mums circulating blood onto the fetal blood. On top of that, fetal hematocrit is also higher than baby's hematocrit. Okay, so usually hematocrit sits around 45%, whereas fetus hematocrit can sit around 60. Now this is the reason when babies are born that they actually, the first couple of days, when they find out they don't need that high hematocrit, they'll start to break down red blood cells, and that will obviously cause a byproduct of bilirubin. And that is why a lot of babies in the first couple of days after they're born will actually appear jaundice. Okay, now it's quite or well, relatively common, not 100%, uh, to have a little bit of phototherapy when born as well in order to help break down and release that bilirubin from the body. Okay, so that's what causes baby to have that slight yellow tinge is the high hematocrit uh, that's found in the fetus. Okay, so once the baby is born, these shunts okay, and these extra vessels from the umbilicus or the ductus veniosus, the ductus arteriosus, they're no longer needed. So what they actually become later on is they become ligaments. Okay, they become ligaments off vessels that help just stabilize vessels themselves. So they turn off and they essentially become ligaments themselves, which is pretty cool. It's no longer needed. And then the circulation will work 
exactly the same as ours. Now it takes about a year for the Ferranum ovari to um, fully form over, so it's quite common for babies to still have a hole in between their septum itself until it can fully grow over after about a year of, of age. Okay, so that's a that's an example of, of rapid ad adaptation that needs to occur from embryonic, uh, sorry, from fetal in the amniotic sac to birth, okay, because the turning off of those particular vessels from the placenta pretty much happen within the first um, day after the baby's born. Okay, so that ends the reproductive system three-part series, finally finishing on fetal development. So hope you got at least something out of fetal development. As I've mentioned throughout, there is a lot that can be learnt within fetal development, and this is an overview. Uh, and if you want to know more, then you can pretty much make an entire career out of it itself. Okay, so until next time, take care.